Okay, I'm going to start by welcoming back everybody to part two of our webinar series in relation to the UK and the US. We've had a great response since our first airing at the beginning of this year. The defence community is energised. More experts have come forward in the United Kingdom and there is a conversation beginning with the state. But it's good news, bad news, because in the criminal courts in the United Kingdom and the United States, black and brown defendants are still suffering a double whammy. Number one, the state calls on police officers to provide their, quotes, interpretation of rap. They are often unqualified, directly or indirectly, the state relies on racist stereotypes. Number two, far too often, defence lawyers don't contest the lack of expertise and fail to instruct independent rap experts to assist in arguments to exclude or to inform the jury about the reality of rap. And on the topic of reality, the state is just so far out of touch with what is actually happening on the ground. Since the first webinar, there's been a lot of drill news. And here in the UK, we have had our first number one track for drill. Tion Wayne and Russ Millions got to the top of the charts last week with their song, body. And over 10 million global streams on Spotify. 10 million. But on another day in another place, I could see the prosecution trying to use some of the lyrics in a trial. But they shouldn't. This number one proves again that drill is mainstream. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if another, harder, musical genre doesn't kick in soon. The issues of inequality remain, and I predict a riot. Brackets, that was a metaphor. Close brackets. My dad, and I have two, my dad, James Reuben O'Brien, he wanted to be on the radio. He had a, a fantastic voice. And well, I'm going to put him on here for a few seconds. That's me and him in Chicago in 2015. Coincidentally, the birthplace of drill. And at the time, it was really kicking off. We should have started a group. Maybe we did. In the 60s, he was driving cabs in the US. When you got inside his car, you would hear classical music playing. Uh, I've got a little bracket here, cue classical drill. Elevation. The white folk would say black guys don't listen to classical music. And a conversation would start with a lot of laughter from James Reuben O'Brien. Stereotypes turned on their head by music and listening in capitals, underlined, listening to a black guy speak. If ever there is a time to have a conversation about music and stereotypes, it is now because the stereotyping has got to stop. It has to end, please. 
If it doesn't, we, the defence, have got to start arguing harder. Go in harder. Instruct defence experts sooner and exclude the hell out of the use of racist stereotypes in a court of justice. It's weak evidence and lazy prosecution. And you know what? It's only, only happening in hip hop. They are the words of Sidney Madden from the documentary, The Racist Roots of Rap on Trial, co-presented with Rodney Carmichael. So let's look at a brief clip from that documentary before we start the webinar. Content. Here's Johnny. It would be crazy if Stephen King was convicted of murder for all the horrific stuff he's put up on the big screen. It sounds unreal, but it's actually happening. But not to screenwriters or your favorite pop and country stars. To hip hop artists on the regular. She. Take Draco the Ruler, L.A. rapper who was in jail for almost three years because of a case involving gang conspiracy. The state used lyrics from Draco's song, Flex Freestyle, as evidence to prove that he was in a gang and keep him in jail. This is only one of hundreds of cases of lyrics being used to put rappers behind bars. It's weak evidence and lazy prosecution. And you know what? It's only happening in hip hop. This is Louder Than a Riot, Lyrics on Trial. It's weak evidence and lazy prosecution, and you know what? It's only happening in hip hop. It sums it up perfectly for me. So watch, please, the whole documentary. But for now, let's get on to what can only be described as a beautiful panel of experts, lawyers, and academics who almost need no introduction, but they're gonna get a little one. From the US, we have Andrea Dennis, a former assistant federal public defender who holds the John Bird Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia School of Law. Eric Nielsen, who is an associate professor at the University of Richmond and a well-renowned expert on rap. The third member of the panel in the US is John Hamasaki, the attorney of rapper, you've just seen him, Drakeo, the ruler. Uh, worth noting in that case, even after Drakeo had been acquitted of all murder and attempted murder allegations, the state still argued that his rap lyrics and videos were evidence of a criminal gang conspiracy. We're proud to welcome the fourth US panel member, Emerson Sykes, a staff attorney with the ACLU Speech, Privacy and Technology Project, where he focuses on First Amendment free speech protections. In the UK, we have Cecilia Goodwin, a solicitor advocate at Stevenson Solicitors, who recently appeared in the BBC documentary, Defending Digger D. And the second UK speaker, our Shahida Begum, a specialist criminal defense barrister at Garden Court Chambers. We're going to start where we left off on the last occasion, talking about experts. In our survey, there were concerns, certainly in the figures, that very few rap experts were being instructed in good time for trials or at all in the UK. So Shahid, I'm gonna ask you the first question. It's a broad topic, but it's now on the issue of black experts in the United Kingdom. I understand it might not be such an issue in the US. Is there a lack of black experts in the UK? And if there is, how are we gonna change it? Well, unfortunately, there is a lack of known black experts in the UK. Um, and I do use the word known deliberately because I think obviously there must be so many black experts out there, um, but it's just a case of we're actually playing catch up at the moment because it's something that I mentioned in part one, that this evidence has kind of come through the back door um, and now it's widespread. So definitely the defense of playing catch up, um, but, for anyone who has seen the Garden Court BLM Series 1, 
um, you'll have seen there were some great experts um, in our seminar series, including several black experts. And also one of the contributors to part one was Dr. Ethna Quinn, who's also a consultant on this series. And she is putting together a network of experts and lots of people have come forward, academics, journalists, linguists. And it's really important that we have that depth because it's not just a case of you might need to instruct a drill expert, but you might need to instruct a separate gangs expert or a separate linguist, because the expert, one expert might not be able to deal with all of the disciplines. And in fact, that's one of the faults on the prosecution side, where they try to put forward one person to deal with everything that they don't actually know about. And, and how can we encourage more people to come forward here maybe um, particularly in the United Kingdom how, how can we get more people um, stepping up to become experts already having that body of knowledge within themselves but be becoming an expert for courts have you any ideas or thoughts on that well I think these you know these seminars are really good because since we've conducted these seminars and webinars. Lots of people have been in touch with Dr. Quinn um, and she is setting up a network um, of experts. So I think it's, you know, continuing that process um, and creating that infrastructure that is what needs to be done. Well, can, can I just say, we've had a question come in already within a few minutes of um, starting asking for details of experts. Um, I'm, I won't read out the person's name at the moment because they might not want me to do that. Um, but complaining about a miscarriage of justice from their point of view involving the use of a rap video. And we'll, we'll answer that um, question directly in a moment um, so they get some information. Um, but can I encourage others who are listening, if you've got um, help you can suggest, if you want to put yourself forward, um, then do that through the Q&A or on the chat um, and um, we'll either publicise what you've got to say or help you out as best we can. Well, let's go across the, the pond to um, Andrea. Um, can I ask you, Andrea, in terms of this issue of um, experts, um, black experts maybe in particular, what's the situation in the US? So um, I think uh, maybe we are, we were a little bit ahead of the curve maybe um, of the UK um, uh, in terms of in particular black experts. Obviously Eric is, is on the call, right? Dr. Nielsen is, is um, one of our um, uh, premier experts, right? Uh, and is helping lead the charge. But I think that there are others who have um, testified in cases, um, maybe um, they are less well-known um, and um, I think uh, they have been doing a good job. I think one of the things that's been important here is um, Eric and I have had conversations and along with others about um, pulling either from academic ranks, right, or from more on the ground ranks of producers and artists um, and uh, um, uh, music directors, right? And so we have uh, tried to think about uh, pulling um, in particular black experts from, from both realms, but I know that certainly there are some um, black experts here in the US, maybe not um, uh, as, as well known as Eric, um, but they're, they're doing good work and they're pitching in. I know that in some individual cases when we are much more of a local or um, regional um, uh, focus. Um, I have worked with attorneys to reach out to individuals um, in either their local or their regional networks, maybe not necessarily looking for a nationally renowned expert, so to speak. Um, I would also say to um, Shahida's point, it's um, important to keep in mind that we're looking not just for experts on um, rap music or the hip hop industry, but also um, linguistics. Um, I've also worked with uh, those in psychology um, as well as we think about this sort of social and behavioral aspects of just um, either artistry or online communication as well. And so I've worked with um, some experts maybe who have just consulted but not been in court experts on um, these matters um, from, uh, and I would say also, it's probably pretty important to think about here in the US, right? Um, we have historically black colleges and universities, what we call HBCUs who have um, a sort of a built-in 
um, population that we can look to for experts as well. And I think that has been important. I've worked with some from uh, at least one HBCU. It, it does feel like we're um, maybe a dec or decade or so behind um, the US in terms of um, expertise, but um, it certainly feels like things are changing. There's a, there's a little clip that we can maybe just play now that maybe emphasizes uh, the nuances and the importance of getting experts and what people might think is straightforward. So we, we can play just a little clip now. Um, it's of Kieran uh, Thapper, um, who is um, an expert, um, works with um, Ethna Quinn. And uh, in this little clip, he's explaining what the word diligent means in the context of drill. So if we just play that now, just to highlight this particular point. If we return to AM's lyric. Broken hearts, broken forms, diligent use from broken bones. Again, it's this idea of perception, but also the way that perception is influenced by your environment. If all you're seeing is dysfunctionality and things that are broken in your family, in your relationships, even your phone's broken, then that's going to set a certain set of expectations in your life and the way you perceive things. However, the idea of diligent use might reflect someone who is attempting to leave the cave, someone who's attempting to free themselves from those chains because they're diligent and they're working hard. It's worth pointing out that the word diligent appears a lot in drill lyrics. Miz or Matt from Harlem Spartans uses it. And Quenface from Zone 2 uses it as well. Among many other examples. Even though the word often appears alongside violent content, why is it that these artists have chosen that piece of vocabulary in their lyrics? What does that say about the music they make and what does it say about them as people? And so, this, this should be compulsory, compulsory viewing, it seems to me. I think for all lawyers working in this area, um, UK and US, um, it's called Drillosophy. Um, just search for it on the internet, um, it, it involves some incredible um, education um, and sets up the importance of having expertise in this area. Eric, can I just ask you to maybe g give your observations as you're um, a an expert in this particular uh, genre and, and your thoughts maybe on um, the importance of um, getting experts involved in these types of cases? Yeah, I think it's really important uh, and for a number of reasons, I mean, some of which I think we've already enumerated, but uh, I mean, for one, uh, it's been my experience that uh, an expert is helpful, obviously, in court to try to provide a counter narrative to whatever the police gang expert has provided, um, a counter narrative to the prosecution's um, argument, but uh, an expert can be very helpful even before that. Uh, in many cases, uh, the attorneys I've worked with, this is the first time that they've encountered a case in which lyrics are being introduced or used as evidence. And so uh, since I've worked on so many, I can often put those attorneys, for example, in touch with others like John who have experience in this. Um, I have draft briefs, you know, that they can, that I can circulate, that they can use for their own, uh, for their own purposes. And so it really is, um, it's important because eventually, this is a this is yes, it's a matter of um, racist uh, approaches to the criminal justice system, but it's also a lack of education. And I have found anecdotally, um, but that when you give jurors um, the education that you know I think they need in order to at least contextualize rap music, um, that the outcomes um, have been favorable in many cases. And obviously I, choose, I, I would refer to John's case. That was a, a very high profile win, uh, but there have been other examples where uh, in-court testimony has clearly affected the outcome in positive ways for these defendants. So um, I would say that, that, that my kind of expertise is, is helpful, but as everybody else noted, there are all different kinds, gang expertise, and I definitely think um, social media, um, you know, that's where we've seen an explosion in these cases. It's, it's been, you know, concomitant with the rise of social media. Um, and almost all of the cases that, are, are, that I'm dealing with now involve YouTube, Facebook, SoundCloud. And so it's helpful to have an expert uh, to provide, 
someone who's actually done research in what's going on and, and, and how these platforms work and how, the, how they are interpreted. Very quickly, I worked on one case um, and it was a threats case. Um, and so this kid had posted some stuff to Facebook, some lyrics, and he was being charged with communicating uh, a true threat. Well, it was very useful to have an expert on um, social media to testify because she was able to explain that, you know, in order to show a true threat, part of it is the intent and what, what was his intent when he did it. And she was able to explain that many people don't understand that when they do this, it's actually being shared widely and so on and so forth. And again, that resulted in a positive outcome for that young man. Well, I think that really does underline how important it is to have uh, an expert and the right expert or range of experts for your case and to get it early on so you're fully aware of the issues. But can we sort of turn this on its head? I'm going to go over to John now uh, and just look at the quality of prosecution or state experts just as a sort of um, overview. And whether you, as an expert attorney in the US, whether you have any tips for us guys over here in terms of cross-examining um, a expert or any other tactics, disclosure issues. So just, uh, yeah, overview first in terms of your experience, in terms of the quality of the state expert. Right. So, you know, where we see a lot of the state experts in rap lyric cases in California is in the gang context, right? And so their um, gang police officers who have been following gangs and think that because of their experience following gangs, they understand what certain terms and words may mean. Um, but you know, having that narrow expertise in this one area doesn't translate into, you know, the whole world and culture and history of rap, right? And I think it's, um, you know, when you take one line out of context and say, oh, here's somebody saying something that sounds vaguely violent or threatening, um, without having a historical understanding um, and an expert to explain the history, it can become pretty difficult. So, you know, you really want to confront them them head on and address the scope of their expertise, right? Uh, you know, are you, you know, what what have you, what study have you done in rap lyrics and rap culture and rap history and African American studies? Um, and and usually it's very thin, right? Um, and they all tend to generally go from a script. Uh, you you basically know what they're going to say oh, I heard this in this song, and this means that they're going to, you know, attack a rival over here. Um, you say, okay, well, you know, um, you know, what other rap lyrics have you looked at? What other rap lyrics uh, within this specific community, within this genre, within, um, you know, the style, the type, you know, drill, gangster rap, and, and usually they don't really have much to say. And so that's, I think, why um, it's important to, to, to have an expert to push back on that. You know, you can go directly at them and, and um, you know, beat up their expertise, but that's the negative. Like you're, you're dissecting them, but you need to have something to fill in that, that void that you've left, right? So if they don't understand what this means in the context of um, you know, rap music, rap history, rap culture, and also, you know, uh, what Eric um, and I think Shahida and Andrea alluded to, which is a lot of this is coming through the internet now. And so there's certain things that are done in the context of internet culture and in, in social media culture in, you know, why you post certain things and how, you know, that is, you know, people are trying to get likes and clout and, you know, become like a, a rap influencer in a sense. Um, so, you know, it's, you have to have, you have to fill the void that's left by um, their, you know, quote unquote, and I, I, I wouldn't really call them experts or I haven't run into a single one that has any expertise. The one, one, the one in Draco, uh, 
listen to punk rock and and the clash which you know hey i i i like as well but uh doesn't really give you any insight into into hip-hop so um you know that's i'll say you can go directly at them through and i don't understand the, the or have familiarity with the uk process i don't if disclosure is the, the same as what we call discovery here, but you can um, formulate requests of anything the expert is relying on informing their opinion, right? So if they did go to a rap music training or a, a seminar, you know, they would they should be disclosing that because that's a basis for their opinion. Um, and I, I, I imagine there's a similar process in the UK. So really just going directly at them and having the expert available and ready to testify to fill in the gaps. Yeah, disclosure and discovery, I think the same thing. Um, just before I go to Shahida and Cecilia over in the UK, um, do, do you think there's an issue over maybe age? Because um, a lot of this stuff relates to, well, speaking for myself, people that are a lot younger than me. Um, and do you need to have at least some input or expertise um, coming from people who are actually in and around the music as it's happening, rather than, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm ancient, but um, you know, old, an older individual who puts themselves forward as an expert, but is maybe several decades removed from what's going on. Yeah, no, I think that that's something that I think everybody's touched on, which is, you know, um, I, I always talk to Eric first on a case and go through it, but it, it's really important. And you can also get this from your client too, to get the, the understanding of where the music is coming from, who the influences are, who are, you know, the people that they look to in coming up. Um, and whether that's artists, poets, musicians, people that are closer to the ground, um, you know, rap lyrics and rap music in the U S um, in different, you know, Northern California, Southern California, LA, Atlanta, it's all has different styles and words mean different things and phrases mean different things. So, you know, you can get pretty granular and, and, and go down and have people that are, you know, in, um, in, in the studio recording, um, another rap artist, uh, is a great idea if you can find somebody who is, you know, really into the lyricism and the uh, culture that can explain what it means. So, yeah, um, as, as young as uh, we are on this panel, uh, having people, uh, I, I mean, you know, just practically babies here. Uh, having people close to the ground is, is, always, is always great. But John, I, I'm going to go over to Sheeda and Sahelia now. Uh, Cecilia now but um, what, what I really liked about what you said was listening to your defendant listening to your client that I, th I, th I think that's call, we can yeah. call experts um, we can cross-examine but at the end of the day we've got to listen to what our clients saying and in this context what they're saying about the music yeah I think that's I think that's crucial and I think that's where you have to start the process, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's spending a lot of time with your client, wherever they may be and, 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 and going from there. Brilliant. Shahida, going back to um, the issue of the quality of the prosecution experts, what, what can you um, tell us about that in relation to your own experience or those? Mm. Well, I mean, my main experience has been when the prosecution rely on police officers um, I understand they do sometimes use academics, but I haven't come across that yet. Um, and normally it will be some very vague statement saying, I saw this once, I heard this, or referring to other cases that haven't actually been reported that are first instance cases, you know, which you can't cross-examine them about. Um, so the real problem is on, on the prosecution side, and this is something actually that has been picked up in an academic article that's just been published um, by uh, Tony Ward and um, there was someone else, we can provide the details, is that actually from their studies, they've seen that there's been a real lack of scrutiny on the part of the defence and judges of whether these so-called experts actually meet the expert criteria 
Because, for instance, when we would have a DNA expert or a cell site expert, you know, we'd be jumping up and down if we had the kind of vague statements from those people. Whereas when it's from a police officer, this nebulous body of knowledge or, you know, evidence is permitted to go in. And I think one of the things is we have to use the criminal procedure rules on expert evidence a lot more in the UK. Not enough people actually go back to that and compare it to the standard of the evidence that they're getting from the prosecution side. And the other main thing is there's a duty, you know, if someone is called to be an expert, they have a duty to be independent and fair. And their overall duty is to the court. I have never seen in any of these statements any sort of balance or any sort of alternative explanation for what might be a lyric or anything like that. And again, that doesn't meet the expert criteria. It, you know, it has to be someone who's independent and who's balanced. Um, and that's something certainly that can be drawn out to either keep the evidence out or if it goes in to highlight that in cross-examination that is this person that they're really hearing from? Are they actually independent um, and unbiased? That's a very, very good point. Um, Cecilia, have you got anything to, to add to those observations or um, suggestions in relation to tactics or cross-examination, that type of thing in relation to a prosecution expert on RAD? Um, I just think here in the UK, um, we're on a voyage of discovery. I mean, we're quite far behind in terms of where the US are now in terms of how they prosecute and the things that they have in place in making sure that experts are actually experts, but also actually identifying the people that are, um, people that you could call as experts. And at the moment, I think we're just at the beginning in terms of understanding the different types of people we can go to, we can ask for expertise in, we can call, we can ask for um, assistance on cases. Um, and I think at the moment, in relation to the cases that I've seen, it's been a police officer doing a statement and saying, this is what I think because I've followed this person or this gang or other gangs for a while. And I think what they're saying in this lyric refers to this person and so forth. And actually, we've got a long way to go. And I think what I am excited about is the fact that we're now having these conversations and we are now identifying that we need people that can come to court and actually challenge this evidence. And there is such a wealth of different places where we could find these experts. I mean, when we talk about clients, I had a funny um, a story when there was a case, nothing to do with me. Somebody else was representing their client and I got approached um, by the legal team in that case QC and um, the junior and basically what had happened was the prosecution were relying on lyrics that had they believed uh, belonged to their client which showed that they were in a gang or had committed you know various offenses or whatever but the funny thing about that whole thing was it wasn't even the defendant's lyrics they were Digger D's lyrics. And the prosecution hadn't bothered to check as to where these lyrics came from. And of course, they were completely out of context in relation to that trial because it was nothing to do with that trial. So it's things um, like that that just make you realise and understand that at the moment, it feels like our criminal justice system is letting everything in. It's like you have an officer who comes along and says, blah, blah, and it's taken as read. And this is why it's so important, first of all, to listen to your client when they tell you, actually, this is not me, it's somebody else. Um, but also to think about all the different types of people that can assist in giving actual expert evidence about the lyrics and what they mean and where they came from and why. Um, because there are far too many convictions just on the basis of statements that really, um, as Shahida said, would not actually um, qualify in other areas of, um, of evidence, you know, DNA and so forth. So I think it's important just to start fighting back 
and to make sure that we're not just sitting there and letting anything that's to do with rap or drill music go in just because we perhaps don't necessarily understand that genre of music. You know, it's important as lawyers that we are challenging this evidence and getting the experts that are available within the music industry or, you know, um, well, there's lots of different types, but which we'll go to um, later. But absolutely, I think there's, it's important to stand your ground. I think so. that, that's what was sort of being said at the beginning on the back end of the, the first webinar. It's, it's, it's saying to the state, please don't even start by trying to put this stuff in. But the figures that we were looking at, and I can say anecdotally, is it tends to be children. It mm. tends to be children that this is being used against, which is horrendous. It's black and brown children, so it's mm. targeted. And then it's not being scrutinised. So we're going to move on to another topic now, freedom of um, expression as a topic. And uh, what we're going to look at is whether there are some examples of legal challenges that can be mounted to exclude rap lyrics or videos, whether they're sort of fundamental sort of constitutional um, arguments or what we might term as human rights arguments probably comes to the same thing. I'm going to ask Emerson, please, just to um, talk a little bit on, on this topic, uh, because it's something I know that's close to your heart and that you're working on at the moment. Emerson. Thanks, thanks so much, Keir. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. I, I only wish we could all be in, in London at the moment. Um, but so, yeah, I work at the American Civil Liberties Union, where we do strategic litigation. So, you know, we've heard from some criminal defense attorneys, and my angle is a bit different. As you said, sort of, we worry about what are the constitutional implications of using rap music uh, and other sorts of artistic expression as evidence. So we usually, we sometimes have individual clients, but more often we're trying to figure out what, are, what, what does the constitution have to say about this. And my background actually is an international human right. So I come at it, not just from a perspective of, you know, what is proper evidence in the criminal trial, but how are we gonna protect these people's fundamental rights to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and in the case of gangs, freedom of association as well. So in the United States, the first amendment protects a broad range of expression. It protects artistic expression, political commentary, social commentary. Uh, and what we're seeing is that even where folks are trying to push back against the introduction of this evidence, you know, they're trying to argue about the evidentiary rules and what we've tried to do through amicus briefs. And I think you have amicus briefs similarly in the UK system, but we think that the value added of an organization like the American Civil Liberties Union, where we've been fighting for free speech for over a hundred years, when we weigh in as amici in some of these cases, we want to say, look, there might be evidentiary rules. There might be all sorts of, you know, problems with the expert or they're not having proper experts. But there's also a fundamental issue here about de denying people the right to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And I think, as you said, Kier, it's targeted to black and brown folks. So we're sort of moving from the evidentiary rules to these sort of fundamental constitutional norms, but also making sure that we center the racial justice impact. Uh, that these types of that these types of considerations or use by the state include. So one of the cases uh, that Eric was an expert in, and then we wrote an amicus brief in, involved uh, it was in Tennessee and involved a black teenager, as so many of these cases do. Uh, and a, a video, a music video, was used as evidence in a murder trial. It was a horrific murder uh, that really had the the community all up in arms. And so the, the judge and the prosecutor were really taking liberties to try to paint these folks as bad people. And so they used music videos that had been recorded months earlier, did not mention the victim, did not mention the crime in any way. I mean, look, obviously, if there's somebody who said, I've never met this person, and in a music video, they're standing together and giving each other daps, you can introduce it as evidence that they know each other, right? But we're saying that the, the Supreme Court of the United States has said protected speech, speech that is protected by the First Amendment, can only be used as evidence if it's relevant to a question before the court. 
And in Tennessee, what the judge said was, or what the prosecution said was, the video shows that he's the kind of person who would engage in gang violence and retaliation because he rapped about something like this. But the question before the court was not what kind of person this person is. The question before the court was, did he commit this murder, right? And a video that happened months earlier that doesn't mention anything related to this crime is clearly not relevant to any question before the court. And that's a violation of evidentiary rules, but it's also a violation of that young man's First Amendment right to express himself and to put out music uh, without having harsh penalties put on him that would not be put on Johnny Cash, you know, the, the, the funny thing about these briefs is that it's always, the only thing you have to see is which quotes somebody uses. Everybody uses Johnny Cash, I shot a man in Reno. Everybody uses Bob Marley, uh, you know, I shot the sheriff. Then I always try to put in at least one local example from somebody within that jurisdiction that might, you know, touch the judge's heart. But uh, that's sort of our approach is sort of bringing back that big picture statement that look, this is artistic expression, this is political commentary, this is social commentary, and everyone has the right to do this uh, without it being viewed as inherently uh, criminal just because of the way they look. Um, Emerson, is this the case of uh, Christopher Bassett? Yes, it's the case of Christopher Bassett, and that's on criminal appeal at the moment in Tennessee. Can, can, would it be okay just to play a little bit of that video, just so we, we, we can get a feel of it? Is that all right? Sure, the L-I-E gay. Okay, I think, I think we got it. Um, available. Um, it, it's just useful, especially with this particular topic, just to see a bit of context. So, be, here we go. Okay. Purchase your tracks today. Purchase your tracks today. Some 20, some four, but I'm four to below. But it's all of a we are. And so, on, on just on a, on a, so we understand it, that was played in court um, as um, evidence that he was a gang member. Yeah, and so you know you had they had a police expert who talked about the the bandanas and the hand signs. Again, there was he was not charged with any gang related offense, right? He wasn't charged with being a member of a gang. He was charged with a murder, uh, and so whether or not they are throwing up gang signs in this video or not is totally irrelevant to the question of whether he committed this particular murder. And I wish you know I I know we we don't have time, but what we talked about was you know there is you know imagery. And, and, and messages being put forth in this, in this uh, video. But when you listen to the lyrics, the complicated rhyme schemes, the references to different you know, issues of the day, of, of local issues, local people, this is so obviously artistic expression. This is not a confession. This is not a written statement of liability. This is an artistic expression. These people are using their genius and their, their talents to tell stories in compelling ways that are, that, that are clearly a part of artistic expression. And the only reason this artistic expression is not viewed as such is because of who these people are. And Eric, can I just ask you to come in on this quickly? Because I know there is, yes. you've got a connection as well. Um, yeah, right, right, yeah. I, I will say that in that case, the gang expert um, at one point uh, expressed that he, he believed that the top 100 best-selling rap artists in the United States were all gang members, um, which is demonstrably false. Um, it was the silliest thing I think I'd heard in a while. Um, in any case, so this was a very this was a very high-profile case uh, because the victim uh, became became the subject of national attention. Uh, President Obama talked about this case at least a couple of times, and so everybody was very very focused. On, on getting a conviction. Um, and so I think that's some of what Emerson was alluding to is that they were sort of doing everything that they could. But, the, but one good thing that came out of it because of all of the attention, I think, um, is that uh, initially when I was called in as an expert, um, the funding body that pays out, that pays experts, denied, denied uh, 
said it wouldn't pay for an expert in rap music, that that was not something that was within what they found they thought was appropriate. And so uh, Mr. Bassett's attorneys appealed that to the Tennessee Supreme Court. And in a very good finding, the Tennessee Supreme, the Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court said that um, if he didn't have, I'm paraphrasing, if he didn't have an expert, you know, that would be a violation of both his US constitutional rights and the Tennessee constitution. Um, and so the expert was ne necessary in order to protect those basic rights. Um, I hope that we can make that more available, that that was filed under seal, so I can't share the document, but it's a really important finding and one that I hope we can leverage moving forward um, as we look for more experts in these cases. And sorry, Kier, just one, one more quick point on this, going back to what Shahida was talking about in terms of police experts. This person made these broad statements about, you know, this is obvious that they're in a gang, but the, his own police database did not list any of the groups that he supposedly was a member of, nor was he listed in the data. I mean, we all have problems with these databases, but if the police expert is saying it's obvious that he's in a gang, but the police's own databases don't list that person or gang, uh, it's, it's absurd in the extreme. And that same expert had testified, I want to say in 30 other trials, something like that. And this was the, and in every other trial, he had testified uh, uh, about somebody who was listed in this gang database. And this was the first time he'd ever been brought in because they were trying so hard to get a conviction. I think his argument was that he was overworked. And so he didn't get a chance to put everybody in the database who should be there. I, I, that's something to that effect. Honestly, it, it yeah, lost for words. Absolutely lost for words. And um, Cecilia, just just um, on this topic here in the UK, again, I, I have a, a, a bad feeling we're, we're behind the curve in terms of mounting um, constitutional or human rights arguments uh, of the type we've just heard um, uh, from Emerson and Eric. Um, do, do you do you have any thing to, to, to say on that in terms of real fundamental freedom of expression type arguments? Have you seen those um, being submitted in court? Well, I haven't seen them being submitted in court yet, but I hope to be able to mount some myself. I mean, the most obvious example for me is with my situation with my client where his lyrics are obviously they have to be handed into the police and so forth and vetted. Um, that to me is obviously curtailing his um, freedom of expression because if somebody is going to be looking at how you express yourself, what you say, what you mean, and you have to justify that, then obviously that curtails your freedom. But also I thought of other sort of um, articles. So for example, when we look at the introduction of uh, you know, bad character evidence, because this is what it tends to be, bad character evidence in, in by way of, you know, drill music or rap lyrics, whatever it may be. Surely there's a fundamental breach there in relation to Article 6, you know, right to a fair trial. How is the imposition of material that can only be prejudicial in most circumstances go towards somebody having the right to a fair trial. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It, it, they don't, there's no synergy there, you know, because most of this material is prejudicial by nature. And there isn't really much a court can do, a judge can do to assist the jury in being able to come up with verdicts that are fair to the defendant. And at some points, you know, fair to the trial process. So that's one thing that I was obviously um, considering. Um, and then also Article 14, and this is a little bit out there, but bear with me, but protection from discrimination in respect of these rights and freedoms. So there is a protection that you're allowed to be protected from being discriminated against on the basis of your sex, your race, orientation, religion, etc. If these lyrics and if the introduction of this evidence as we see it is prejudicial and is racist then surely it means that there is a breach in relation to that article that you're not supposed to be discriminated against um so yeah so i, I hope that in the uk we'll be able to do more by way of um, introducing these articles in relation to our um 
our arguments and our challenges. But yeah, those are the sorts of things that have jumped up at me in relation to um, the breaches that are occurring as a result of the introduction of this evidence. Can I just jump in quickly, Kier, here? Because just a note on, on Cecilia's client, like the, the conditions that have been put on the on your client and other folks in the UK, just to note that those would, I don't think would, maybe, John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, those would never fly in the United States. The, the, the efforts to put gag orders on folks, uh, we push back against them. Courts do try, and sometimes they get overbroad, but the kinds of limitations on what kinds of things you're allowed to say in a song ahead of time, that kind of judicial order I would want to say, I don't think I'm being too optimistic here, that kind of thing would never fly in a US court. And it's, um, sorry if I jump back in, but it, it's, it's really kind of reassuring to hear that from across the pond, because obviously, as I said, we're in the, you know, sort of baby stages um, in the UK in relation to dealing with these sorts of orders and so forth. But I mean, it just seems unreasonable, doesn't it, to say you can't, you can't, sing about this, you can't sing about that. And I think you touched on it before when you said um, a lot of the um, artists who are, you know, having to, to have these challenges, they're just trying to put their art out there. But one thing is they are, you know, they're artists. They are very creative. They are trying to make sure that they um, do well in their trade. And we're saying, no, sorry, but we don't agree with that. Sometimes we don't understand it, therefore we don't agree with it. But yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we've got obviously lots of great minds thinking alike, but just looking at the chat almost uh, around the same time, we've got Dean uh, Kingham um, also mentioning not just Article 14, but Article 8 and possible Article 3. Just coming full circle for this, um, Andrea, um, have you got any other um, tips or observations maybe for us in the UK uh, catching up with the approach uh, in America not not just in terms I it seems to me of um, attorneys but actually the courts having a maybe more progressive uh, view at least generally speaking um, on I see you're smiling so I'm gonna let, let I'm gonna shut up and you you tell us so, um, uh, yeah, thanks for that lead in here. I've sort of had uh, in the back of my mind is um, repeatedly it's been said, you know, the UK is following behind the US in many respects. And I've sort of had this cringe inside that I tried to hide because I do think in many respects, the the defense bar, right, um, maybe is, is slightly is slightly ahead in that we've just been looking at this longer. We've been strategizing longer about it. Um, but a significant um, aspect in this whole phenomenon, right, as you all are quite well aware, is what the courts do, right? So it's one thing to have a strategy. It's one thing to battle the prosecution, right? But you present it to the judge um, uh, and the judge is making the decision about um, admission or exclusion. And what we have found, we've long found this in general with experts, um, is that judges are not performing what has been clearly established as their gatekeeping function, right? The Supreme Court, just generally speaking with respect to all experts has declared that the courts, the judges, trial court judges have a gatekeeping function that they should exercise independently, right? They shouldn't just rely on what the prosecution claims about the need for expertise or the qualifications of their particular expert, um, that judges should act independently. Um, and so what we find generally and particularly in this area with respect to police experts and now with respect to um, police expertise on gangs or rap music is that judges are basically abdicating, I think, their, their independent gatekeeping function. Um, and so, right, defense attorneys can raise challenges, right, pre-trial and during trial, which um, increasingly we are seeing doing, done. Uh, in a very strenuous and rigorous way. But if the judge just, you know, um, makes a decision, you know, the evidence, or actually we'll start with if a constitutional challenge is reigned, that the, there's no constitutional protections here. We're just using this evidence to establish some criminal act, right? We're not prohibiting speech or chilling speech, right? Um, uh, so they're very quick to dismiss any constitutional, First Amendment constitutional challenges. And then with respect to the evidentiary rulings, they're very quick to say, well, police can offer this expertise, right, um, with, without any serious inquiry um, into the qualifications or the, the helpfulness of the testimony or the quality of the principles and methods that 
police are supposedly relying upon, but we would all, I think, agree they're not relying on any principles and methods. Um, and so this gatekeeping function is not being um, uh, adhered to. And so what this means is despite all our efforts, right, most often judges will admit the evidence. And so that's particularly um, problematic, but that's the next sort of wave of effort, right? Um, educating judges, convincing them that they need to serious, more seriously undertake their gatekeeping function. And part of that is requesting defense experts, requesting funding for defense experts, right? Continually raising these First Amendment challenges. I would also say maybe similar to the UK and thinking about human rights challenges. Um, I've sort of long been thinking about what we have here in the US are due process challenges, that there's a fundamental unfairness um, as a constitutional matter by admitting this um, type of evidence, which is, is separate and apart from a First Amendment challenge. It's a completely different um, constitutional provision that gets at general fairness or lack of fairness of proceedings. Um, and so I think that is uh, another effort that we can undertake um, with judges, not just relying on the First Amendment, but also due process. I will say, and maybe John, I, not to put you on the spot, you might um, have some thoughts on this, but um, there also is the need for sort of legislative efforts to require or remind judges of their particular responsibilities. And there is a particular success, I think, um, in California um, recently with the Racial um, Justice uh, Act, which essentially, as I understand it, um, was enacted really sort of late in the last legislative cycle, but allows for challenges that um, during court proceedings, the judge, an attorney in the case, or a law enforcement officer, or an expert or juror used racially discriminatory language about a defendant's race or ethnicity or national origin or exhibited bias or animus, whether or not purposeful, right? So to the extent that what we are talking here is about either reliance on express or implicit biases that create unfair um, prosecutions, Right, it may be that this particular statutory um, provision can be helpful, which is distinct, right, from the constitutional protections we've been talking about, which is distinct from the evidentiary rules that we've been talking about. This is a new particular statute, which I think uh, is going to require, if it's invoked, that judges um, be mindful about the evidence that they're admitting, whether it creates an explicit or implicit um, uh, animus, and so. Again, this is a completely new act. Um, it's it's just in California, but it offers some interesting thoughts um, and additional strategies. Um, but again, trying to convince other jurisdictions to enact a similar type prohibition will be important, which then can right force the hand of of judges in a different way. Well, that, that's I mean, it's it's amazing to to get all of this information, and I, I really hope we can. Um, gather some of it together so we can disseminate it um, in, in the next few days or maybe a week because there's a lot there. I'm, I'm going to let John off the hook, although I'm sure he wasn't on one and he knows everything there is to know about this because I just want to move to another topic because we haven't, if only we had more time. Um, and it's a, still in the context of um, a freedom of expression, but it's, um, it's going to be a video we're going to play a little clip from. Um, in a moment. Um, it's from, again, um, the same series, Louder Than a Riot. And it's the issue of whether the lyrics, the actual lyrics themselves, can constitute a crime. Uh, and so we'll, we'll play this clip. It does uh, bring us back to John's um, most recent uh, case, Drakeo the Ruler, and I'll ask him to, to, to deal with the that particular topic and anybody else can add to it. So we'll just play this clip just very briefly. The lyrics enter criminal cases in numerous ways. If it started with cases like Mac Phipps, where lyrics are used to establish motive or character, it's totally evolved now. Lyrics themselves can actually be the crime. That debate was elevated to the highest court in the land this week. Pittsburgh rapper Jamal Knox, stage name Mayhem Mile, in prison for lyrics threatening two police officers in a 2012 song. Sound familiar? They also reference Dr. Dre on the track. So if you know, you know. This is a throwback to the NWA classic. 
Now, in full, you can hear the song deals with a lot of the same themes of police brutality and harassment. Arguing for First Amendment rights, Mayhem Mall attempted to take his case all the way to the Supreme Court. And big names in hip hop, from Chance the Rapper to 21 Savage, joined in to support him, penning a legal brief that laid out how the conviction takes Mayhem Mall's words out of context. But the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. And this use of lyrics as threats in order to put people behind bars, it continues. Some rappers are even starting to talk about it in their music. Like, let's go back to Draco. While locked up, he recorded and released this song, Fictional, from his mixtape, Thank You For Using GTL. Keep the hook. It might sound real, but it's fictional. I love that my imagination gets to you. Draco's calling out prosecutors who are using his raps against him. Now, Draco got out on a plea deal in November 2020. But his lawyer credits his release on a changing of the guard in L.A. County that brought in a new reform-minded DA, one who doesn't support these types of cases. The first black... Okay, and again, recommend watching that documentary. Um, John, can you... It's a big topic. Um, It actually dovetails with a lot of what Andrea was saying as well. Can you condense that to about three minutes, please? (laughs) The case? Everything. So, um, well, you know, it was the beginning clip that we saw earlier where it had a lyric that said, RJ is tied up in the trunk. So that was the prosecution's entire theory for this conspiracy to murder a rival rapper in L.A. named RJ, um, who was who was also, you know, uh, an up and coming and, and well known in L.A. rapper. But they said that because he said RJ's uh, tied up in the trunk and RJ had released some diss tracks that didn't um, directly mention Draco, but are what what we call over here like sneak disses or subliminals, um, that there was a motive to conspire to kill him. Um, Conspiracy to murder is 25 to life here. And so based on that lyric and the uh, the rap beef, um, they were trying to convict him. That's where, uh, you know, Eric was able to come in and talk about the history of rap beefs and rap battles and how it has evolved from the very first days of hip hop. Um, And, you know, the jury was really, uh, I think, open to that idea. And it intuitively made sense. And that it also made sense when you understood it in the history um, of, of rap music. Another thing I'll add, um, going to what Emerson uh, talked about, and uh, Professor Dennis as well, um, in that case, because of, you know, Draco is a very big social media profile and had a lot of fans, um, part of his, his world and his, um, his art, you know, basically his artistry was his uh, kind of the performance he did on social media, which was uh, always interesting. But the prosecution request and the judge issued a gag order basically silencing him from everything. I don't remember if the, if the, uh, um, and eventually they asked him and received the, the order from the judge that in, in effect put him in solitary confinement, which as you know, I don't know that you folks do that over there, but it's widely condemned as essentially torture, cutting somebody off from everybody around them, denying them to use the phone, have visits, talk to people. Um, and so we had to fight that all the way up to the Court of Appeals. Uh, luckily, we had some some great First Amendment counsel, Susan Seeger from uh, University of California at Irvine, and uh, the Los Angeles Times and others and other First Amendment organizations joined in with us to fight the gag order in that case. I didn't know Emerson at the time, but I would have reached out to him if I now that I know him next time. But you know that case in every way was about speech. Um, he was initially, after he was arrested, put in solitary confinement for a tweet um, that was basically saying, I'm taking all my music down. You know, this has ruined my life. Thank Detective Hardiman, who is the, you know, arch nemesis in this case. Um, but it was really, you know, about speech. It was about his lyrics. It was about his tweets. It was about his music. And so um, it was, it was, you know, uh, 
there's usually more of a tie, I think, to real life in, in a lot of these cases. But this one was really about targeting somebody um, for being a brash, bold, outspoken young black man in L.A. And even after the case started, he didn't shut up. And they were very, everybody from the prosecution to the police to the judge was, you know, tried to silence him. And we had to fight it through one trial, another trial stopped because of COVID. And then it settled on the, on the second, our first day of the third trial uh, in November of last year. So, Which, by the way, was the day that the new progressive prosecutor was elected, correct? Within one day, their case was so bad that as soon as the new progressive prosecutor came in, they caved and settled. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I think that was that was definitely a factor. But, you know, it it was an incredibly weak case to begin with. The The counts had been hung 10 to 2 for acquittal and 7 to 5 for acquittal at the first trial. Um, which generally you don't refile those cases. Prosecutors will generally dump when they've already been beaten that badly. But because this was a high profile case, the prosecutors wanted to double down and try to redeem themselves. They brought in one of their um, purportedly top trial attorneys to go for the next round. But unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to to go all the way. It got him out of custody the same day, but... Um, would have loved to gone to all the way to the jury on that one. And we, I think we know what would have happened. And um, on, a, on a quick look, um, his track, Fights Don't Matter, now 2 million views, I think, on the internet. Something yeah, like- he's got a, he has a song out with Drake, um, some other big artists. He's, he's really been doing well. So, um, you know, it's, it's been um, an uphill, you know, taking his place back because he was on the front page of the style section of the LA times in LA, like a week before they indicted him on this case. Like he was really about to take off. They took three years from his life and career and ability to make money, feed his family, take care of the people around him. Um, This, this is probably, you know, in my career, the most openly uh, outrageous um, prosecution that nobody stopped, right? When the police do something wrong, the district attorneys are not supposed to file that case. When the district attorneys do something wrong, the judges are supposed to stop it. Nobody stepped in, nobody did anything. Um, and we had to fight you know, for years to, to, to get them out. And I think an important um, thing to remember in the context of what you've just said is that is what happens to a, a man like that who is commercially successful and um, has a degree of confidence to get himself through. But many of the people that we represent aren't even close to that. And, and that, that's that's what's got to be remembered. And if that can happen to people like Drakeo, the ruler, goodness knows what goes on day to day, week to week, year to year. And that's what we're talking about in terms of educating all of us, speak for myself, of course, um, and to stop the use of rap in criminal trials. Right, we could spend um, years, I think, talking about the freedom of expression, but there's a lot of good ideas that have come up uh, there. I'm going to move on um, as best I can through some more questions, and then we'll go to what's being posted in the chat or um, in the Q&A. But the next on the list, this is going to Shahida. Um, and it's a question in terms of if, if this evidence does go before a jury, um, are there any directions that a judge uh, should be giving to um, deal with stereotypes in relation to the music, in relation to black or brown youth, in relation to gangs? Um, Should we even be contemplating such directions? But what should be be going on in court in terms of the judge and the jury in this evidence then, Shahida? Well, technically the judge can give any directions that he or she feels is necessary to make sure that the trial is fair. But often, even when this evidence goes in, I haven't seen any judge who'd be willing to go near 
any of the topics such as stereotypes of black youths, gangs. In fact, they play it very straight down the line of just dealing with it within the confines of bad character evidence. So the usual directions that they would give of why they've heard about that evidence, they can't convict mainly on it. They, you know, they have to look at the other. They will very much just within the framework of the ordinary bad character rules. Um, and I was thinking about this, actually, that it would be interesting to ask a judge <laughs> to include some directions about racial stereotype. And I wonder what the response would be. Um, and there is scope for them to do that because actually in the UK, um, along with the judicial training, et cetera, but there is actually a equal treatment bench book, which is guidance for judges to make sure that, you know, that people are treated fairly within the system. And I think lots of people actually overlook that um, judges themselves overlook that that guidance is there. And certainly that's something that you'd be able to draw upon um, to say to a judge. I mean, there may be cases that you don't want any direction like that whatsoever. And you might think it'd be more damaging and you want to minimize the evidence, you want to mock the evidence, you want it to sort of just be a small part of the case rather than highlight it. But if there is undertones of those issues, you know, it would be interesting to see how a judge would react and how would they formulate it. And in fact, whether it would lead to them not admitting the evidence at all, if they think that it actually makes them realise that it's too dangerous to let this evidence in because it is more prejudicial because of racial stereotypes rather than um, it being probative. And it is something that there are me and some other people at Garden Court who are going to look into this issue, actually, of general judicial directions um, and whether there is any standard formulation that you can come up with or whether it's very much a case by case basis. Thank, thank you very much, Shahida. I'm, I'm going to ask Eric to just deal with the next question. It, it's something that we um, put out um, in terms of the the webinar and it takes um, this issue to a completely different level. Um, we haven't got enough time to do it credit by any stretch of the imagination, but it's the issue of capital cases and uh, being an expert uh, on RAP in Lowe's. Can you just, I know it's, it is almost impossible in the, in the time we have, but Eric, can you give us an idea of what it's like giving, an ev giving evidence um, on this topic in those cases when the penalty is death. Uh, it's very hard to describe. Um, it is, uh, it's not something that I particularly enjoy and it gives me uh, uh, a ton of respect uh, for capital defenders, uh, folks who routinely take these cases because uh, when they lose, right, the, the, it's the ultimate penalty. Um, I have in one, I testified in one case, you know, usually the, the, tr the trial in, in capital cases is bifurcated. So there's the guilt phase and then there's the penalty phase. Um, and so in one case I testified in the penalty phase um, and uh, it didn't, it didn't go well. He was, uh, he had already been convicted and then the jury, uh, you know, sentenced him to death. Uh, fortunately um, in another one in Arizona, um, he actually almost got off completely. He was almost acquitted fully, but it, it was, uh, the case was bad enough that the prosecutors eventually backed down and just gave him a life sentence, just gave him a life, life sentence. I think it's just, it, it's a reminder of how significant the stakes of this discussion are, whether it's the death penalty or what is effectively a death penalty if you're going to be in a cage for the rest of your life with no hope of ever getting out. That is effectively the end of your life as you, as, as you, knew, as you know it. Uh, it's, it's, it's the end of the, the life that you, you had with your family. And so, yeah, the, the capital cases um, are, are, are particularly uh, difficult. Um, I'm happy to say that my home state of Virginia is the first state in the South to have eliminated the death penalty. Um, come on, California, let's get this done. All right. Um, thank, I'm thank sorry, Kier, can I offer one, one additional thought here, actually, too? Um, 
Eric mentioned, which I think is important, that uh, in capital cases, there are um, there's a very strong bifurcation between the guilt, innocence and the penalty phase. One of the strategies that defense attorneys have to think about is if you are able to exclude the evidence from the guilt, innocence phase. And we've talked all about why that might be quite complicated. Um, the judge is, because of the rules for sentencing, right, is quite likely to admit the evidence in the sentencing phase. Um, and that can be an added, right, an added blow, right? Suddenly now the jury is hearing about all this evidence that they weren't privy to in the guilt innocence phase. And they're hearing now essentially what we've talked about is how horrible, you know, the client is, how dangerous, how hyper violent, right? They've got this um, glamorization of a particular lifestyle, if not engaging in the particular lifestyle. So there's a, there's a tension between, right, presuming that the likelihood that your client will be found guilty is the outcome, right? Suddenly now, all of this information is coming in before the jury and that sort of offers an extra biasing effect um, for the jury, which is now considering a death sentence. Um, and so that becomes a particular strategic concern to think about. If there is any bright lining to a capital please. case. Yes, please. Um, it's that uh, because the stakes are so high, um, jury of voir dire questioning is often um, much more robust um, than in your ordinary um, uh, trial or your less serious trial, even your less serious trial that might involve conspiracy or RICO or racketeering charges that could involve life. And so a much more ex extensive jury voir dire in a capital case might allow for the judge being willing to ask probing questions of jurors about their perceptions of particular music, the perceptions of um, artists, um, how they think about social media. So that might be, if anything, a possible very, very, very small silver lining in a capital case. Yeah, it's really small. Um, and Emerson, I'm going to ask you um, a question. I, I, I can I can feel that that's it's going to end in a negative answer as well. So I'm not sure I'm going to invite any of you lot back. Um, so Emerson, um, it's it's a topic I think again that you have uh, written on recently, and it's um, in relation to prisons in the U.S. Uh, understand you've got a very different system in term well, a different system in terms of how they're organised. Um, but uh, you've been active in relation to uh, prisoners' rights and their um, right to receive rap music, black music, and or literature. Um, again, th this is a topic that probably deserves its own webinar by itself, and maybe that's something we'll do in the future. But uh, can you just give us a taster in terms of what's going on and any, any positive news, please? Well, the, the case you're talking about is out of Arizona. Uh, and there, they had one of the problems, as you mentioned, with our system is we have 50 states. Uh, each state has its own. We have federal prisons, but then we have each state has its own prison system. But then each county will have its own set of facilities, and they're all managed in a totally decentralized way. So each facility, there are thousands of, you know, incarceration facilities around the United States, and each of them have their own rules for what they let in and what they don't let in. Uh, but what we've been trying to do is there have been a few high profile situations where certain books have not been allowed in, um, you know, books like The New Germ Crow uh, was banned in a couple of prisons. And, you know, usually what we can do is we can write a letter to the prison saying this is absolutely ridiculous. And the easiest thing for the prison to do is just let that book in where we don't actually get to the fundamental issue of these really problematic policies. So we have been looking for opportunities to, again, strategic litigation not just to try to get individual documents, newspapers, pictures into a particular facility, but to try to sort of protect people who are incarcerated its First Amendment rights more broadly. And in Arizona, uh, we weighed in on a case, again, as amici, uh, where uh, someone who was incarcerated requested a bunch of CDs, including The Weeknd, including um, uh, Kendrick Lamar, uh, several hip hop CDs that were blocked. Um, as well as a couple of books by, uh, by Elijah Muhammad. They were Nation of Islam texts. And basically, Arizona has these very broad prohibitions on uh, violence, depictions of violence, depictions of gang activity, de sexually explicit materials, uh, as well as racist materials. Now, all of these might on their surface make sense, but the way that these were crafted uh, the, the person who was incarcerated, who filed pro se, he, he filed this suit on his own, 
basically said that there was a de facto ban on rap music. And if you look at a lot of these facilities where they publish their list of banned materials, you'll notice a theme, right? There's a lot of hip hop, there's a lot of rap, uh, and you won't find Johnny Cash, you won't find Bob Marley. Uh, and there's, so we've been trying to push, we weighed in on this particular case to, to show how unconstitutional Arizona's particular policies are. We're right now trying to gather information on, on more states to figure out if there are others that are vulnerable to this. But the problem here, as Andrea was mentioning earlier, is that the courts are very deferential. At the end of the day, it's gonna be up to a judge. And to try to convince a judge that it is their responsibility to tell a prison to let something in that the prison doesn't want to let in, you know, the, the deference is really, is really extreme. So uh, unfortunately, some of these restrictions are also extreme. So we think that we can push back on some of them, uh, but it's an uphill battle anytime you're engaging in any kind of prison litigation in the United States. Yeah, well, I was right. That, that's, I mean, it's just so depressing. <laughs> I, 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 I find it hard to comprehend that you're, you're talking and telling us about something that's happening now. It, it sounds like the sort of thing that would be happening, I don't know, in the 70s, in the 60s, in the 50s. That, that's what it sounds like. And yeah. that now you'd be telling us how progressive everything is. But you're, you're, you're describing events over the last few years. Is that right? Yeah, no, this is, these are current things. And I, I mean, when I, when I said that we certain things would not be allowed or that we are a decade ahead. I agree that we don't want to overstate that. You know, as you mentioned, there are, there are some high profile successes. There is more understanding generally among some sectors of the bar. But as you mentioned, there's got to be, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of folks that we don't ever become aware of where these kinds of things are happening. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to say that things are much better over here. And, you know, we even had a state, the state of Georgia, at one point threw up their hands because they were getting so much grief over their, their, their banned books list. And they said, okay, we're banning everything except the Bible. And I think they've now since walked that back, but this just shows that these, these prison officials really believe and they have strong evidence that they can get away with anything. And, you know, in the fight for free speech, unfortunately, folks who are incarcerated, folks who have been convicted of crimes, and God forbid, folks who actually might be guilty of those crimes are at the back of the line. We're talking about who gets the protection and who gets uh, the resources to try to protect their rights. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is another uh, webinar in its making. In, in terms of um, the UK panelists, do you want to say anything very briefly about this or shall I move on to the questions that have come in from the audience? No, we're all, we're all actually depressed now as a result of this. Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, I, haven't, I have had situations where certain articles have been removed, certain types of books. So, I mean, uh, books in terms of Islam, I've had a, um, a, a client who's had those removed for various reasons. But again, it's, it's always a constant battle with the state to say, actually, they should be entitled to have these. Why have they been removed? And so forth. Um, but I think the way that um, in the UK maybe uh, sort of inmates get around most of this is having a radio because then you're not having anything sent in per se. You're just listening to what's on the radio in terms of what's, um, what's popping at that time, I guess. So, yeah, I think it's, it's slightly uh, different here. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like it's an absolute nightmare um, over the pond in relation to what can and can't be brought in. Right. So on that um, rather depressing topic, I'm going to, I hope, some positivity from the audience um, in terms of questions uh, asked. We had relatively limited time left, but um, we'll go with um, Dan Jenkins. He's sent in a a question just very recently and he says as a student currently planning a thesis replicating Fishkoff's study I um, hope you're all aware of that um, but in a UK drill context I was wondering if any of the panel have thoughts on the importance of psychological research being used to counter this evidence in trials how often I think is it used or how crucial is this empirical um research so anybody wants to um here we go eric's first uh, 
Well, I was just going to say it's, it, it is, it, it's, it's been a really, really valuable tool. I mean, we have, you know, some studies as Dan probably knows going back to the, uh, to the 1990s, including the Stuart Fischoff uh, study. Um, and we've seen uh, significant research in the last five or six years that's, uh, that has been approaching it empirically in order to demonstrate the prejudicial nature of this material, um, the, you know, the, the, the racial stereotyping that is associated with it. And actually that's the kind of thing that I think we need more of. Um, I think that is the type of thing that will speak to a judge. Um, if you can say, look, uh, we have this study, this study, this study, and, and the Fischoff study he's talking about is actually in a jury context. It's actually criminal justice specific. Um, I think it becomes much more difficult for a judge to admit this material um, if there is just stacks of research indicating that doing so is likely to prejudice a jury to the point where someone's not getting a fair trial. So I would say that it has been incredibly useful to me. Um, it, it's a central part of, uh, of our book. Um, it's a central part of any time I draft uh, that Jamal Knox case you referenced, anytime I'm drafting an amicus brief, there's always a section focusing on, on that and we just need more of it. So um, any, a, any additional studies are, are helpful and, and I do believe effective. Yeah, let me let me just add to that really quickly from a, a trial lawyer perspective. You know, the judges really need something. You, you, you can't just come in and say this is, you know, racist and discriminatory, although it's true, but having actual proof um, in, a, in a scientific uh, setting demonstrating that this will impact juries. Seeing videos, hearing these type of lyrics are going to prejudice um, the individual on trial, right? Because one of the one of the rules, which I believe you have something similar to is whether evidence will have unfair prejudice. Well, yeah. here's studies proving it. So, you know, we have, have gotten a, a good body started here. I, I imagine that you folks can use that, but it's probably helpful to have UK studies as well that would um, support your arguments in court. Well, I was going to ask um, Shahida or Cecilia, have you ever uh, been able to use uh, that type of research in, or heard of others using it in a UK context? Um, oh, very good. Um, so again, we're kind of, again, a bit behind the curve. So it's only now that it's coming through. And in fact, the, one of the articles that I mentioned earlier on, I think the author might actually be in the audience because he's helpfully given me the name of the co-author of the article. So the name of the article, and I recommend it to everyone, um, it's called Bodies of Knowledge and Robes of Expertise, Expert Evidence About Drugs, Gangs and Human Trafficking. And the authors are Tony Ward and Shahzad Fowlad Band. Apologies if I've um, pronounced that incorrectly. But it's a really great article which examines, you know, the use of this as expert evidence and is quite cr critical of not only barristers but also judges. Um, and that's that gives a bit more authority. So again, if you're in court, rather than you're there just on your own being critical of, you know, the person you're trying to persuade. It's much easier if you can point to an academic piece of writing to say, look, these people have studied, looked through these number of cases and this is their conclusion. And in fact, another article, it's something that I mentioned last time in the context of what the police are doing at the moment is they've got a joint um, study with UCL the, where they're examining um, lyrics and it's a very statistical approach where they're trying to determine if the, if it's, if, if the video essentially crosses the line in terms of negative connotations and positive connotations. And half of the article, I'm afraid I just didn't even understand it because it was just statistics and empirical study. But the very interesting is that right at the end, it says that there is actually very little evidence to suggest, empirical evidence to suggest that any violence mentioned in a song translates into real life violence, which again is something that would be really useful to put in front of a judge um, to factor that into their reasoning 
And that was an article that's also quoted in, again, I mentioned it last time, it was a report commissioned by the mayor of London's office, you know, the Serious Violence Reduction Unit. Again, another a bit of authority that you can use in court that it'd be quite hard to argue against. And Cecilia, do you want to just say just a few, few words? We've not got much time left. No, it was just really to, um, I mean, in relation to the last point that Shahida made, you know, the, the link between what's said in a song and what happens in reality, I think a study such as that is so key. And if it's um, something that you can point to um, in court, for example, when you're dealing with jurors and obviously, you know, putting in your closing speeches or trying to argue it out, that's actually something that would be invaluable in relation to challenging this evidence and saying that what is the benefit of this evidence actually being allowed in in the first place. So Dan, uh, basically we're all saying get on with it. Thank you very much. Uh, look forward to seeing your report um, as soon as possible in the UK and it sounds like on the basis of this panel it will go elsewhere. Um, very, very quick question on the topic of experts again because that's run throughout the whole of this. It's uh, from uh, Janice White. Um, uh, a, a general question about what qualifies someone as an expert in these sort of uh, situations, these spaces, as uh, she's framed it, and also a sort of follow up um, in terms of how uh, systemic racism will play into who is considered to be an expert in the view of the court, um, because ultimately it is the judge. Um, that will be making the decision and I suppose whether the prosecution oppose uh, the admission of defence expert evidence. So does anybody want to pick up on well, who can be an expert in, in relation to rap or drill um, and whether there's going to be a pushback maybe from the establishment, uh, either in the guise of the Crown um, or judges in relation to the admission of maybe a rather novel or unique expert in the context of the justice system. Anybody want to just quickly, a few words on that? You've silenced. Uh, I, I will say that I, very quickly, um, right. My experience is uh, sometimes the state does oppose my testimony. Um, oftentimes the state does not. In every case, my testimony is allowed. I've never been sort of denied as an expert. I will say that I think Andrea uh, gets uh, a lot of credit for that. Um, you know, not not long ago, uh, experts were not common in the United States, and they're still not common relative to the overall number of cases. Uh, but she wrote uh, an, a law review article, I think it was published in 2007, making a very compelling, uh, well-informed argument for why we need to have more experts. And I think that that was a uh, an important um piece of scholarship because I think it started to open the door. So now I think uh, 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 experts like me, uh, I, I think are far less likely to be denied a chance to testify. I will just add one thing though that I've noticed, and this is, a, this is sort of one of the problems here is that the expert is, as we know, is not a silver bullet when it comes to this practice. And in fact, I have seen situations where the, the uh, the introduction of an expert um, actually is gives license to judges to let more in than they should. So I have seen judges where maybe somebody, the defense counsel is arguing this is prejudicial, this is whatever. The judge says, well, you can just let your expert rebut it and then lets it in. And so I have seen situations where I think judges feel like they are let off the hook from making the difficult decisions because of the presence of an expert. Well, we're unfortunately at, at a point now where we've we've, we've got to wind down and um, uh, you guys have got to get back to the afternoon. We've got to get back to the evening. Um, and anybody who's watching in between has got to do whatever they've got to do. But I really, really want to just thank the panel. Um, it's, it's been a fascinating tour, a rather depressing one, but a fascinating tour of how um, rap music uh, in maybe in one breath um, finds an audience amongst so many different and varied people appreciating 
uh, the artistry with millions and millions and millions of people um, recognizing that, listening to it, sharing it. And then we have this horrendous parallel universe where it's being used to prosecute predominantly, as we've discovered, uh, young black and brown children in court. And I think what's particularly disturbing, sadly, from what we've heard to uh, today, is it's not just now within the courts. It's We see it in maybe every part of the system, including prisons, restricting basic fundamental rights. And we've all got to redouble our efforts in terms of uh, defending and spreading and educating. Um, but I'm asking as well, the state, those involved in prosecution, arrest and charge to start that conversation because it can't carry on. It just can't carry on. And as I said before, uh, mainstream drill now, it's going to be something else because the inequality is still there. It's got to change. So, um, if anybody can think of anything positive uh, to say, please say it now. Otherwise, I'm going to bid you all uh, farewell. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Oh, that's a good positive to end on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time.